Welcome movie lovers. As many of you would know, the movie Winchester was recently released, which is a movie about Sarah Winchester and the Winchester Mystery House, and it claims to be based on true events. Now, I haven't seen this yet, aside from the never-ending parade of negative reviews. I was actually against this movie from the moment I learned about it. This movie is essentially perpetuating the false stories about Sarah Winchester. After I learned about the Winchester Mystery House, I did a lot of research on it, and it was fascinating what I learned. So I would like to share with you today the story behind the story, and from there you decide what you believe. Many, many years ago, I was watching just one of the many shows I used to watch that focused on the paranormal. I am a believer of the paranormal, having had many experiences myself. I love the subject, I love studying the field, or hearing people's accounts, or reading things from people who work in that field. So one day I was watching one of these shows where a group of investigators were investigating locations dubbed the most haunted places in America, and one of the locations on this list was the Winchester Mystery House. Now, what stayed with me from watching this was not only was this the most bizarre and most fascinating house I'd ever seen, but the mediums who went in there came out declaring not only did they not sense any presence in the house, but they could never sense a presence having ever been in the house. So basically, when a spirit or spirits occupy a location for a long period of time, they leave a sort of spiritual imprint before eventually passing on. So what these mediums were saying was that they had no reason to believe a spirit had ever resided in the home because there was no such spiritual imprint and there certainly wasn't anything around right now. This got me asking, so then why is this dubbed the most haunted place in America? And so began my research. Sarah Lockwood Winchester, born Sarah Lockwood Party, was born around 1840 in New Haven, Connecticut, to a respectable upper middle class family who eventually moved up in high society. She was a highly intelligent woman fluent in French, Latin, Spanish, and Italian. So intelligent and so well respected that at a young age she was admitted to Yale's only female scholastic institution, which was known as the Young Ladies College Institute. In 1862, she married William Wirt Winchester, who was the treasurer of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. In 1866, she gave birth to her first child, Annie Party Winchester, who sadly died just 40 days after her birth from Erasmus, which is a severe form of malnutrition caused by a severe deficiency of nearly all nutrients, especially protein, carbohydrates, and lipids. In 1881, Sarah's husband William died of tuberculosis and she inherited $20.5 million, which in today's currency is around $520 million. She also received nearly 50% ownership of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company due to William's father having died the previous year and willing the company to his only son. This large ownership now meant she was given an income of roughly $1,000 per day, which in today's currency is around $25,000 a day. Safe to say she was rolling in money, but now here is where her story gets foggy. After the death of her husband, it was claimed that a grief-stricken Sarah began to believe that she and her fortune were cursed by those who had died from her husband's rifle. They then claimed she reached out to a Boston medium by the name of Adam Coons, who told her, while supposedly channeling her late husband, that she should leave her home in New Haven and travel west, where she must continuously build a home for herself and the spirits of the fallen victims of the Winchester rifles. She was also told that if she ever stopped construction, she would die. She then moved to California and in 1886 purchased a house and land in what is now San Jose, California and began construction. Some issues with this. Firstly, there is no evidence to even suggest Sarah Winchester ever met with Adam Coons, none at all. Secondly, after the death of her husband, Sarah Winchester actually travelled to Europe for three years, though nobody knows where exactly or what she did there, they just know that she went there. Thirdly, Sarah Winchester actually moved to California in 1884 at, with her sister and her niece, and this is far more likely due to the fact that majority of her living relatives were living in and around California at the time, with many having moved there during the 1849 gold rush, so it is far more believable she moved to be closer to family. 
Sarah Winchester did indeed purchase her land and property in 1986 and began construction immediately. Using her intelligence and skills, she was the architect of her own home and no doubt used a great deal of her studies and possibly even time in Europe as inspiration for the house. However, this was not her only property she owned. In 1888, she purchased land in what is now downtown Los Altos for her sister and brother-in-law, and in the 1920s, she owned a houseboat on the San Francisco Bay. Now, keeping in line with the many rumors circulating about her, another was that she used the boat as an insurance policy fearing a second great flood such as the one Noah encountered in the Bible. While there is also no evidence to support this, and it too appears as nothing more than society gossip because, in fact, during this time it was very normal for people of Sarah's social standing in California to own houseboats or yachts, and it's not like she was short of a quid. It was claimed that the moment construction began, it was continuous work, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year for 38 years. This has not only been disputed by contemporary scholars, but Mary Jo Ignofo, who wrote a biography on Sarah Winchester, claims that letters from Sarah Winchester herself state that she often would give her workers months off to rest and give herself some quiet time. It seems as we go along, more and more comes along to debunk the Sarah Winchester tale. Sarah Winchester was a private woman who liked to keep to herself and didn't typically interact with her neighbours or people in high society. And during this time period, it would be easy for bored rich people to start making up stories about a rich woman who lives alone and just builds a house. There are a great deal of stories about the nature of the house itself, many of which have also been brought into question and would suggest they were merely stories created by the current owners as marketing tools. I personally am far more likely to believe this. Stories claim that Sarah Winchester was a highly superstitious woman. However, not a single person who worked for her ever claimed such a thing, nor did any of them claim her to be guilt-ridden, another characteristic she was known by. In fact, her nurse and companion of many years, Henrietta Severs, strongly denied any claims that Mrs. Winchester had any spiritualistic beliefs. Actually, according to Sarah's biographer, Roy Lieb, the son and law partner of Winchester's lawyer, stated in 1925 that Mrs. Winchester was as sane and clear-headed a woman as I have ever known and she had a better grasp of business and financial affairs than most men. Frankly, to think of the things she did and how to design and execute them would take a far more intelligent and stable mind than an unstable one. But the myths and legends of the house continue. The proprietors of the house claim that Sarah was fascinated with the number 13 and worked this number into many areas of the house. For example, there were 13 bathrooms, many windows had 13 panes, chandeliers had 13 candles, and the list goes on. But biographer Ignofo attempted to debunk this too. She writes the account of a carpenter who worked on the property for many years who claimed that many architectural elements such as chandeliers and windows were altered after Winchester's death. If this is true there could be many reasons such as ensuring the upkeep of the house or creating elements that fit a bankable narrative. There is even a logical explanation behind some of the bizarre aspects of the house, such as doors and stairs that lead to nowhere. In 1906, construction of the house had led it to reach seven stories in height. Unfortunately, that same year, an earthquake occurred that reduced the house to a mere four stories. As a result of this, Sarah ordered that these areas be boarded up and that they not proceed to go any higher than four stories. With this in mind, it is far more likely to believe that at one point these stairs and doors did lead to rooms and areas, but the 1906 earthquake destroyed them. It is believed that the style in which the house is built is what saved it from complete collapse and also saved it from a collapse in a previous earthquake in 1989. The house was built using what is called a floating foundation. This type of construction means the house is able to shift freely since it's not completely attached to its brick base. As the years went by, Sarah continued to design her house, hiring no outside help from architects. Designs and construction stopped on September 5th, 1922, when she passed away in her sleep from a heart attack. But what if the ghosts that supposedly were haunting her, and were, as many claim, the reason for her building this obscure home? Well, before I go on, let me bring this question to your attention. If Sarah Winchester did, as so many claim, believe wholeheartedly that her family and her money were cursed and being haunted by the spirits of those who died at the barrel of Winchester rifles, 
why for the next 40 years would she so willingly continue to spend and profit off this weapon? Remember, she was profiting $1,000 a day off the sales of that gun. $1,000 a day for 40 years is over $14 million. The sales of that gun were paying for this house. If she did believe she was being haunted, as everyone says, she would not have touched another Ren cent. But back to the ghosts. In the early 1990s, renowned parapsychologist and paranormal investigator Christopher Chacon, if that's how you pronounce it, was granted entrance to the house where he conducted a 720 hour investigation which lasted 30 days. His around the clock assessment resulted in 1,440 documented events in the house, but of those 81% were determined as explainable factors. However, the other 19% were deemed anomalous in nature, meaning they could not be scientifically explained. Chacon also interviewed 328 subjects, of those 164 reported having had paranormal experiences, while the other 164 reported having none. Of the 164 who did have experiences, Chacon determined that 71% of their experiences were subjective and could not be objectively corroborated. Basically, what all this means is we have a lot of people saying things, but very little evidence to back it up. Since then, many paranormal investigators and mediums have gone into the house, many to cash in on the house's notoriety. While some have made claims of paranormal activity, not many have had any substantial evidence to back it up, with one walking away with nothing more than a witness saying she got a creepy vibe from the house. I think many of the feelings people experience in that house can be attributed to the very nature of the house, but not knowing how to describe their feelings, they settle for haunted. The Winchester Mystery House is an architectural marvel, one I would love to see for that reason alone. I think the abstract and unconventional nature of the house can give off an uneasy feeling to some people. We know when picture homes to be one way, so walking into this house no doubt can be unsettling for some and give them creepy vibes. Not to mention, tourists are going in and being told stories from tour guides that are designed to creep them out, when in fact most of those stories have absolutely no foundation in reality. Actually, one tour guide back in the day went on record saying that the owners at the time encouraged the tour guides to make stories up. This was all designed to bring in more tourists and generate revenue. But it also means a completely fabricated story being circulated about a woman based on nothing more than stories and rumours. What makes the house a true mystery is that we will never truly know why she did what she did or how she came up with her ideas. The Winchester movie seems to be just another person's attempt to cash in on this poor woman's life and when you look at it that way, it's actually quite disgusting that all these people are more interested in making money off her and what stories they can make up than actually representing her in any honest way. To add insult to injury, the movie didn't even make that much as it was a complete flop, no offence to Helen Mirren. If you were disappointed by Winchester and would like to see something along the same lines but actually done better, I would highly recommend the 2002 three-part miniseries Rose Red. This was scripted by the fabulous Stephen King and he actually took some inspiration from Sarah Winchester and the Winchester Mystery House. While it is in no way a series about her life or her home, the way it takes the elements of her story, both fact and fiction, and turns it into its own very eerie story, I found brilliant. It's still to this day one of my favourite pieces of work by Stephen King. The plot focuses on a reputedly haunted Seattle, Washington mansion named Rose Red. Due to its long history of supernatural events and unexplained tragedies, the house is investigated by parapsychologist Dr. Joyce Reardon and a team of gifted psychics. After having heard everything I've said, if you go and watch this now, you'll be able to pinpoint what aspects of Sarah Winchester's story inspired Mr. King. On that note, I would like to leave you with a quote from part 2 and 3 of Rose Red. I feel it not only depicts the tone of Rose Red, but in a way can explain the feelings or beliefs associated with the Winchester Mystery House. Houses are alive. This is something we know. News from our nerve endings. If we're quiet, if we listen, we can hear houses breathe. Sometimes in the depth of the night you hear them groan. It's as if they're having bad dreams. A house is a place of shelter. It's the body we put on over our bodies. As our bodies grow old, so do our houses. As our bodies may sicken, so do our houses sicken. And what of madness? 
If mad people live within, doesn't this madness creep into the rooms and walls and corridors, the very boards? Don't we sometimes sense that madness reaching out to us? Isn't that a large part of what we mean when we say a place is unquiet, fested up with spirits? We say haunted, but what we mean is the house has gone insane.